our series at the table. And you know, we started last week, and, and when you look at the table, you got to think of food, right? So the first thing we kind of talked about last week is we began to look at food, and, and in the very first pages of God's Word, and in the end of, of God's Word in Revelation, food is mentioned. Food is talked about, as a matter of fact, on the sixth day when God created man, he told man what his food would be. And he called that day very good. And unfortunately, what we found out and what we learned is in today's world, what God said was very good, the world says is our enemy. You know, we we look at food and and we think, well, the doctor said I can't eat this and I can't do this. And we look at people's photos and, and they photoshopped it so they got no wrinkles and their teeth are really white. And all of a sudden, they lost an extra 20 or 30 pounds. You know, I wish life was that easy that I could come up here and say, today I want to be 30 pounds slimmer, and bam, it's done. That'd be pretty neat, wouldn't it? And then, you know, during wintertime, hey, it's kind of cool. I need to put 30 pounds on and insulate, you know. But unfortunately, we can't do it like that. And, and, you know, like I said, what God said was very good, the world has made very bad. And even back in Leviticus, in Leviticus 23, you know, we get this list of feasts and and these list of feasts. And you know, when you go to a feast, what are you going to do? You're going to eat, right? So it's this time of coming together that God tells us to set aside. And and just some of the feasts in there is the the Sabbath, you know, where we should celebrate the Sabbath or the Passover or the first fruits and even the Day of Atonement. So these were all times set aside by God for people to come together and and seek him and also take that time to eat and feast and fellowship and have time together. And and unfortunately, the world has made it what it's not. And, And unfortunately, I think we forget about the benefit of food without having it at the table. You know, we don't take that time to come to the table And I think a lot of times we also forget that food is rich in culture. It's very rich in culture. You know, whether you're eating street tacos or you're eating some green curry, you got to think of the culture that comes behind that food, the culture of all the spices, the culture of everything that was put into it and how it had been handed down from one generation to the next on how to prepare these different meals. And You know, as we get all these different techniques and and we get to taste all of it, what we seem to forget is the time spent where some of these nations were oppressed and some of these people were oppressed. And we'll talk about how we like the food, but we don't think about the consequences these people went through to pass on that family meal or that family recipe for the food that continued going on. And I think what we need to look at is understand that the table is a place where everything can come together, where we can find joy, where we can find peace, and most importantly, where we can find reconciliation, where we can take that time and put the past behind and just have a meal and just be able to come to his table. And we're going to be looking today at a table of reconciliation But before I do, I have to ask you a question. Have you ever made an excuse to not go out to dinner with somebody? I'm glad you all said that because I was going to say, I have. I've done it. Yes, your pastor has actually come up with an excuse that was probably a lie at the time for not going out to eat dinner with somebody. So, you know, and I kind of figured, well, I'm going to be honest. I'll come up front and say, you know, I have lied. I've lied about not wanting to do something that I really didn't feel like doing. But, you know, we came up with this excuse. And and, and to be honest, I I don't know if it was really a lie because, you know, we can take these excuses and and make them sound so good that it really doesn't come off as a lie. You know, you know, we all had that common excuse. You think about that. Well, you know, something, you know, Brother John, I'd love to be there, but something urgent came up. Now, he may have actually gotten that in a text message from me in the past. John, I wasn't lying at the time. (laughs) Something urgent actually did come up. 
But, you know, and, and we, we give that, you know, well, something urgent came up. So we don't have to explain what the urgent was, right? You know, that urgent very well could have been, man, I'm going to sit home because it's the season premiere of my favorite show. Or maybe for me in some cases that, that something urgent came up. Ben and Jerry's was on BOGO and Patty got me my favorite flavor of ice cream, you know. Or Taliente was on sale and I got my favorite gelato. So it's urgent I got to stay home and eat this ice cream so it don't go bad. So technically it's not a lie when I said something urgent came up, you know. And we can all make these different excuses, you know, oh, well, hey, you know what? I got to pack because I'm going on vacation. You know, I got to do laundry because I'm going on vacation. Of course, I'm not going on vacation for two weeks, but so I'm really not lying, right? And some merchant came up. I got to get this done. So, so you see, we all make excuses. Sometimes we get really creative. Oh, I, you know, Mike, I'd love to, but you know, I just put a casserole in the oven. See, I, some of y'all have heard that before. Hey, you know what? I would love to, but you know, I was sitting on the toilet and my legs fell asleep. When I got up, I broke my ankle. Now, many of you are sitting there going, well, I understand the falling asleep while sitting, you know, my legs falling asleep because it's happened, you know, so you get kind of creative. Or how about this one? I got a bit of a slight problem. I was cleaning my ears and I got the tip of a Q-tip stuck in my ear, so I got to go to the emergency room and get it out. That ever happened to anybody? Believe it or not, it's an excuse that someone gave. My all-time favorite excuse, and I'm waiting for the day I get to use this, is I can't make it because I have to teach my pet fish how to swim. <laughs> I'm waiting for the day that I'm able to use that lame excuse. You see, we all got lame excuses. We all got lame excuses, and, and we use them, and we pawn them off as something that's real. You know, and, and well, you know, I really, and instead of being honest, hey, you know, sorry, dude, I just don't feel like it tonight. Instead, we'll pawn off this excuse and, and we'll think that it really means something. And, you know, unfortunately it doesn't. And, and I think what ultimately happens is that we don't understand that, that when we feast, when we take this time of feast and we get a taste of the kingdom. So we get to taste the kingdom during a time of a feast and and what we do is at that table, we get to celebrate what God has done. Not only what he has done, what he can do, and what he ultimately will do in the future. And, and all that comes at that table when we take that time to feast. But instead of making excuses, I think we as the believer, we as a believer can be confident that God is abundantly able to, do, to use the table to carry out his will including the reaching of the lost. So we're going to dig into God's word today, and we're going to look at a parable of Jesus that talks about a feast or a banquet. And the one thing we're going to see is we're going to see excuses because we all have them. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible with you, the words will be up on the screen uh, we're going to be in verses 15 through 24. So let's go ahead and dig in. It says, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he told him a man was given a large banquet and invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is now ready. But without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a field and I must go and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to go try them out. I ask you to excuse me. And another said, I just got married and therefore I'm unable to come. So the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, maimed, blind, and lame. Master, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, and there's still more room. Then the master told the servant, 
Go out into the highways and the hedges and make them come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those people who were invited will enjoy my banquet. So Heavenly Fathers, we dig into your word today. Lord, I ask you to open up our eyes and show us where we make excuses. Show us where we're not obedient to your call in our life. And, and Lord, may you be glorified through this whole thing. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so what we see here is Jesus is, makes this powerful parable about salvation. So, so this banquet is all about salvation. And ultimately, it's in response to an answer that a Pharisee gave him. So, and to give you context, Jesus was just telling parables before this, and he's eating a meal with Pharisees. And this Pharisee had this flippant answer to Jesus. So Jesus digs in to begin this parable about this banquet and telling the Pharisee about it. And so Jesus compares salvation to a feast. And unfortunately, I think a lot of times as Christians, or we, we all know those Christians who once they accepted Jesus, it, it seems more like a funeral. You know, they got a tombstone under one arm and a coffin under the other. Well, I want you to understand, when you come to Jesus, it's not a funeral, it's a feast. You're not going to go to a funeral. You're going to go to a feast. When it is said and done, we will be at the wedding banquet of the Lamb. We will be feasting together. And so it's definitely not a funeral. And, and, you know, through my life, I've attended some feasts. You know, I've attended some homecomings, some family gatherings, revivals, some really good Thanksgiving meals here. So, so I've had my chance of having some feasts, but, but ultimately I don't think them or Alton will ever compare to the feast that we're going to have with Jesus. As much fun as it is, as much fellowship as, as we have, it's never going to be the same as spending that time with Jesus. And it's never going to compare to what I've gained through my salvation in him. As good as them homecoming feasts are, as good as Thanksgiving is, it doesn't compare to what we receive through Jesus. It doesn't compare to that salvation. And I believe that when we sit at the, the salvation table of the Lord and, and you kind of think of a, of a table that's nicely set up for a meal, I think we're going to see that dish of forgiveness. So we see a dish of forgiveness. We see a tray filled with, with peace and grace. And maybe we look over and we see these bowls that are filled with joy. Just imagine what that table's like. We see plates that have his sweet love on them. And that's the kind of meal we get with our salvation. We get to see all that when we come to the table with Jesus. And see, this, this parable is about this invitation to come to this great table of salvation. To, to come and enjoy and to partake. And that's why I want to kind of spend some time today. You know, in, in verse 17 of the scripture, we, we basically saw that the invitation was extended. So they basically put it out there, sent the servants out. And, and to give you some background, when there was a banquet or a feast in biblical times, it wasn't like, hey, I'm having a dinner party tomorrow night. Can you come? What they actually did is they sent out invitations weeks or months in advance. So they sent it out all this time in advance. And you know them RSVPs that none of us do nowadays? They were actually required to send a letter back to tell them if they were going to be there or not. So they'd have to send this letter back. And then actually when the feast or the banquet arrived on that day, once all the food was prepared and everything was ready... They'd send the servants out to get the people who said they were coming. So when you start to see excuses, you wait, it's like, wait a minute. This was planned well in advance. They said they were going to be there. And then they came up with excuses in the end. And so as we look at this and, you know, we got to understand, think of how simple the invitation was. Come. Come. 
And, and I, think, I think that word come is one of the greatest words in the Bible. It was used by Noah. It was used by Isaiah. And we know it was used by Jesus. Come and follow me. We, we know it's a word that's been used even in the book of Revelation. Let whosoever come. It, it's that invitation. It's that to come in and knowing that whoever you are, no matter how bad you are, no matter what, if you come to Jesus and accept him, you will be saved. And you will be invited to that table of salvation and you get to see all those bowls of joy and you get to have that life and feast with Jesus. And it's that simple, that simple invitation of just come. Just come, come exactly how you are. Come as you are and let him change you from the inside out. The invitation was solid. Everything is now ready. So come, everything is now ready, which means it's not like one of them dinner parties when they say, hey, be here at 7, and you get there at 645 so you can be the first in line, and then dinner isn't served till 9. Come on, I know you all know them dinner parties. Or, hey, you know, be here at this time, and they're just starting to cook. You're like, you know, this is Thanksgiving. Turkey got to cook a long time. You just put it in the oven. We're going to be here all night. They told them, come when everything was prepared. Everything was ready. Come to the party. Come and enjoy. And understand, when, when he's saying this and he's comparing this to salvation, it's basically God saying, Everything is ready. Everything is ready for your salvation. Everything is ready for you to come. All you got to do is come. Everything is ready. Understand, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. Through his tears, through his suffering, through his death, through his resurrection, it opened up. Come. Everything is now ready. When Jesus was on the cross in John 19, 13, after he received a sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he gave up his body. That is the moment that we as Christians know that it is ready and it is prepared. The table has been prepared for us to come and dine with Jesus. And that's what we're called to do. And this is exactly what you see here. It's easy. It's easy to do it, but people don't do it. And it even is urgent. Now everything is ready. Don't let it get cold. Now is the time. Now is the Hey, now everything is ready. Come. Now is the day of salvation. There are many people who make excuses of why they're not coming now to salvation. You got people who make excuses of why now they don't come to church. And the same excuses an unbeliever gives believers give for not coming to church. Or even for not coming to Jesus, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Remember, those who received the invitation and did not come will not get a taste of the banquet. It's kind of like the scariest words in the Bible. Depart from me, I do not know you. But Jesus, I've done all this in your name. Depart from me, I do not know you. Those who were invited and didn't come will not taste the banquet. We need to understand right after all of this, now, you know, come now, everything is ready. We saw the excuses. We saw these lame excuses. And now think about it. The, the excuses sounded kind of good. You know, they kind of made sense. Hey, I just bought a, some land and I got to go see it. Now, I can understand that, you know, because... I can see buying some land as long as it's not like oceanfront property in Arizona. You know, maybe buying land and not going to see it till afterwards. You know, maybe with today's technology, you got Google Maps and you can kind of see what it looks like. But then I bought some oxen and I'm going to go work them. I wouldn't be buying no oxen if I didn't know they could work. You know, I would have checked them out first. Or the one I really like, I got married, well... Dude, if you got married and you received this invitation a couple weeks or a month ago, you would have been planning your wedding. You should have said you're not coming. So even though they sound legitimate, they sound like good excuses, we, we can actually see that they weren't good excuses. And, and like I said, we, we see people make excuses all the time. We, we see people make excuses for, 
for not coming to Jesus. We see people make excuses for not coming to church and, you know, oh, I'll put it off till tomorrow. Proverbs 21, 27, 1 says, don't boast about tomorrow for you don't know what a day might bring. But they make excuses. They make excuses, and we're stuck. We do the same thing. But remember, in God's word, it says that the sinners are without excuse. And it says people are without excuse in Romans 1, verse 20. So we're actually without excuse when it comes to the, to the, to the Lord. But I think it's funny, like I said, the excuses we hear. I don't go to church because there's hypocrites in church. There's going to be a whole lot of hypocrites in hell too. So if you're not going to come to church, you're not going to come to Jesus because there's hypocrites here, man, you're going to spend eternity with them. But that's an excuse we hear. I just find it totally amusing. Or I, I like the, I, I just can't live that life Jesus wants me to live. What life does he want you to live? What life does Jesus really want you to live? I think that's more of I don't want to give up my sin. But, but you kind of like, well, I can't live that life. To me, it's kind of like saying, hey, I'm not going to go to the pool till I learn how to swim. Or, hey, I'm not going to touch the piano till I learn how to play it. How are you going to learn how to swim if you never get in water? And how are you going to learn to play a piano if you never touch the keys? But then people will say, oh, I can't live that life. But they don't even take time to open up God's word to see what the life is. Or to see what we're actually called to do. Because they think it's all of these commands. Oh, you got to do this. You can't do this. You can't do that. Well, we have freedom when it comes to Jesus. We're all messed up. We're all jacked up, but we're all loved by our God. And, and no matter what we go through, we know we can still go to him. And honestly, you know, I don't think we actually can live for him anyways. Because it requires him to live through us. You know, because if we try and live for him, we're just going to fail. And even Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We live that life because Christ lives it through us. That's what allows us to be able to do it. The other thing, well, you know, I'm just really not feeling it. That's okay. You're not going to feel it. But when Christ lives in you, you will feel it because that's when you're really going to feel it. Think of your salvation story for some of us. Remember, I, I remember sitting in a pew and it felt like that pew was on fire. I felt something. What I felt was the Holy Spirit telling me it's time to make that move. Up until that day, I really didn't feel it. I kind of was one of them go through the motion kind of people. I knew I went to church. I went to confession. Remember, I was raised Roman Catholic. I did all that stuff. I really didn't live the life until that pew got really hot and I had to make that move. I like the other one, there's too much to give up. Well, I didn't have to give up anything except my sin to follow Jesus. And, and I still sin, I still make mistakes, but I still got my God. I still got Jesus to be there for me. I've got that forgiveness that comes with it. And, and, and I can't live with it. It kind of makes me think of someone who's got cancer. And then they go to the doctor and they're like, hey, doc, don't, don't, don't take that cancer out of my body. I'm kind of attached to it. I kind of like it here. So, you know, I know you can probably do something about it, but don't do nothing about it because I'm attached to it. You know, because I don't want to give it up. Because, you know, it's part of my story now. Kind of like the, I'm too great of a sinner. Have you ever looked at who's at Jesus' table? Have you seen the people? Take time, open up God's word. Look and see who's at the table. David, Peter, Rahab, Mary Magdalene. They're all at that table of salvation. If they can make it to the table of salvation, I think we can too. You, you, you look at who they were, drunks, harlots, drug addicts, religious people, all made it to the table. In the story, he says, I want my whole house to be full. That is God's grace right there. He wants his house to be full. He doesn't want a place at the table not to be taken. He wants every seat to be taken at that table. 
That is grace. It don't matter who you are, what you've done, what excuse you might have. He wants you at his table. He wants you in his house. And I think so many times we forget about that. He wants his house full. I think it's interesting. He tells them to compel them to come inside. Compel them, you know. Make them come in. Make them come into my house. He doesn't want his house to be empty. See, as kids, we were made. We, the, my mom made me go to church. She made me come to the house. So many times in life today, parents don't make their kids come to church. We don't make people come and join us. God wants his house full. What can we do? Now, granted, Make someone come sounds kind of harsh, but we can compel somebody. We can compel them. Compel means to persuade. So we should be able to persuade someone to come to the house because if he wants his house full, then whose job is it to make his house full? Us, exactly. Us as believers are called to build his, to be his house. We're the servants that are going out to the highways and the hedges to bring all the people in. I think it's interesting. Look at who came. The poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. So in this story, Jesus is using people that the Pharisee that he was talking to would never think about inviting into the house. He used the worst of the worst, the people who they consider outcast, to be the ones who came to the banquet. It wasn't the religious elites. They're the ones who made the excuses. It was those who the re religious elites would feel were unworthy were the ones that God had come into his house. Each one of us is unworthy because each one of us falls short of the glory of God. But he's invited each one of us to come into his house. And, and I think as believers, we must ask ourselves if we're actually willing to participate in God's work of using his table to bring people to his saving knowledge. And, and unfortunately, I think sometimes as, as believers, we, we know the, that God really wants his house full. Sometimes maybe we get overzealous, you know, and we start becoming real like Christianese. And, and we start saying words that people don't understand and we try and walk like we're this perfect person. Instead of just saying, to, walk it up and go, man, I messed up just like you did. Guess what? I, I mess up. Let me tell you about the old me. Let me tell you who I used to be. But man, look what God's doing in my life today. And you're able to take those steps and use it to glorify God. And you're able to go forward and bring people into his house. And instead of getting overzealous and, and trying to be perfect with everything we do, the church is not built on perfect people. And if you're ever out there looking for a perfect church, I hate to tell you, there is none. Because we're all imperfect people in an imperfect world following a perfect God. He is the only one who's perfect. And honestly, if you leave a church and go to another church thinking, well, I don't like this church anymore. It's not perfect. I don't like the carpet. I don't like the music. I don't like, I don't, I, 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 I. You're keeping you in the equation. So when you go to another church, guess what? All them imperfections are going with you. So that perfect church is also going to become imperfect. Geographical theory. Geographical theory. I like that. <laughs> But, but we think and we get this overzealous, and I, I think we need to understand that the table is so unique. The, the table is so unique, and it, oper it gives that opportunity for joy, hope, and understanding. It gives us that opportunity for people from different lifestyles and maybe even having differences of opinion to come together for the one who created us, for the one who has invited us to that great banquet, that we can come together and we can put our past behind us, we can put our prejudice behind us and all be focused on the same thing, focused on our Jesus, praising and worshiping him in all that we do. See, people don't crave perfection. 
People aren't craving perfection. A lot of us are perfectionists. We're, you know, we got CDO because it's got to be alphabetically correct, not OCD. So everything's got to be in order. And we think everything's got to be perfect. Well, that's not what people are looking for in this world. They're not longing to be impressed. Oh, my God, you gave me the head of the table. People aren't looking for that. You know what people are looking for? To know that they're cared for and know that they're loved. That's what counts. So guess what? It don't matter if your banquet is on paper plates and you got sporks. It's about having that time together about coming together as a community, coming together at the table, putting all bygones, everything aside, and come together and focus on Jesus, focus on his word, focus on the salvation that was given to you, and plant those seeds that God calls you to plant. See, because we get so caught up on what everything's got to look like. The table can be paper plates. It doesn't have to be fine china. It doesn't have to be the proper setting because guess what? I don't know what fork to use and spoon to use anyways. Whatever fork I pick up, I'm using it for my whole meal. I'm using the same fork, the same knife. Now, I will use a soup spoon for soup. That's about it. So all that other stuff is just fluff. It doesn't need to be there. And so many times we bring that into our life. We have all this fluff that's not needed. Create a space of love. Create a space of love and character and creativity for people's souls where they can come together and get healing. They can get healing both spiritually and culturally at the table. Verse 24 said, those who offered excuses and refused to come were going to be left out. We're going to be left out. You see, it's not enough just to be invited. Everyone's invited to the table. You have to accept that invite. You have to come to that table. You have to sit at that table, and you need to taste it. You need to taste that salvation that Jesus gave you. You need to taste it and know that the Lord is good and continue to do what he's called you to do and continue to move forward and understand because when we feast, we get a taste of the kingdom. When we feast, we get a taste of the kingdom. We get to know exactly what he wants. He wants everyone at his table. So we get that chance. And at the table, we celebrate what God has done, what he can do, and what he will do. It's not just about the past or the present. It's about the future. Those seeds that you're able to plant in someone's life at the table can bring them to salvation. And instead of spending eternity in heaven, they can, instead of spending eternity in hell because of the seed you planted at the table, they can spend eternity in heaven and enjoy the banquet of the marriage supper of the Lamb. All because of us simply doing what, we call, what we're called to do. And, and as the believer, we need to be confident that God is abundantly able to use the table to carry out his will, including reaching the lost. He reached you at the table. He reached each one of us at the table. We need to open up our tables to others and allow them to come in. So, of course, my question is, what what are you going to do with his invitation? What are you going to do? And if you're not going to accept that invitation... Write it in your Bible, write it on your notepad, whatever it is. I'm not accepting the invitation because, and write down that excuse. And then go back and look at that excuse and tell me if you think it's really going to hold up. Because ultimately, we all make excuses. Will they hold up in front of Jesus? And if you don't think he's going to hold up in front of just you look at him and be like, man, this ain't going to happen, then you know he's not going to accept it either. So we need to stop making excuses and we need to move forward with what God's called us to do and be obedient to his call. 
So the question is, will you come and sit at the table? Each one of us is invited. And when you come and sit at the table, will you invite someone to come and sit at the table with you? You see, because there's many who have received that invitation and made an excuse. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've made that excuse that, you know, there's too much to give up. There's hypocrites in church. I got too much sin. Well, God's word says that we all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. So guess what? If you're a sinner, you join a, a crowd. Because we're all sinners and we all fall short, even me. But God's word does say if you can confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's when it starts. That's when you know now it is all ready. Everything is ready. Everything is done. It has been finished. It was finished on the cross at Calvary for the day for you to come in and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. As it says in God's word, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. So if you make an excuse, stop making that excuse. And whether you're here in the room or you're with us for church online, you can make that move today and accept Jesus. During our final song, I'll be up here on the side and you can come up to me and we can talk about it. We can pray about it. And you can join this messed up, jacked up family. And you can come sit at the table. And if you're with us online, you can go ahead and let us know that you want to accept Jesus today and we'll provide you with some information about it. But you know, then there's people who are sitting here in this room who are like the Pharisee who's questioning what Jesus had to say and who still make excuses for not inviting people to your table. Or, or you're trying to be that perfectionist and trying to have it all together and you're trying to beat Jesus into somebody. We can't beat Jesus into anybody. We need to open up our tables and invite them to come in. In this story, Jesus used the least of the least to show the Pharisee how wrong they were. Some of us act like Pharisees. We act like we're above other people. Oh, well, I can't hang out with them. They're too bad. And you seem to forget where you came from and understand that salvation is a free gift. None of us own it. And it's our job to give it to others. It's our job to tell them about our Jesus. And maybe you're in this room and you've been like the Pharisee and, and you're not taking that time to invite people to your table. Either right where you're at or you can come up here to this altar and you can leave it right here today. Simply, Jesus, I, I'm not inviting people to my table. I'm not doing what you called me to do. then ask him to show you the people to invite to your table because he wants his house full it's up to each one of us to fill the house like I said it's not about filling this house and filling this church it's about filling the kingdom of heaven filling heaven up filling up the house of the Lord and I want heaven to be full and for those who don't like loud music, heaven's going to be loud. It's going to be multitudes of people singing. And by the way, it says it's going to sing a new song. That means it's not going to be an old hymn. It's going to be a new song. Heaven's going to be loud. I can't wait to hear. So let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you. And, and Lord, we're so grateful that you've allowed us to come and sit at the table. You've allowed us to come and be part of the salvation table and knowing that we'll be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But Lord, each of us knows someone who's not going to be there. And we know those people who make excuses. 
And Lord, unfortunately, sometimes we make excuses. We make those excuses on why we won't talk to someone about you. Lord, I ask that anyone here within the sound of my voice that does not know you will make that move today, Lord. That they will make that move to come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior and come to your table of salvation. And Lord, if there's anyone here who who hasn't been inviting people to your table or hasn't been showing that they even belong at your table, that they will make a change today and do what you've called them to do. And Lord, so we can fill your house and make sure every seat at the table is taken. Because Lord, that is what you want. And we want to do your will. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us here today at FBC Lantana for Church Online. And, and, and if, if you enjoyed what you saw today, I'd just like to ask you to go ahead, go to our website and, and help support this ministry as we try and outreach and reach the lost for Jesus Christ. And you can just go to our website, fbclantana.com slash give, um, and you can make an online donation right there. Again, I encourage you to get connected to a local church, and especially if during this message you felt compelled to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, definitely go tell somebody. Let someone know because that is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. And, and from there, get connected to a local church. Hey, we would love to provide you with some resources with that. You can go to our website, fbclantana.com, and on the very front page, you say, give my life to Jesus. Click on there, and at the bottom of there, there's some links and some good information for you. And just wanted to say, welcome to the family.